trunk did you mention um all the people that didn't take the role for neo did we talk about it yeah before? uh tom cruise will smith and brad pitt That's will smith wild. is the most interesting one will smith yeah. went to do wild wild west which you guys may remember and uh oh, yeah. june Watch it. Yeah, Bagger. That's you know, what, what literally in my head. That was <laughs> Wild, 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 Wild West. West right? You know what's yeah. crazy? Yeah. That format for Men in Black too, where like yeah. the the hit the, the song hit song. That's, we, a, that's a good point because really. I forgot that was a very two thousands like thing where you with Will Smith specifically. Miami. Oh no, no, Miami weren't a film. Sorry, my bad. You should have been. <laughs> but it should have been. Yeah, it could have been Scarface. You know what I mean? Like bad remake boys. of Scarface. Oh, bad boy, but yeah. Bad boys, bad yo. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're right, Will Smith. What? That, that, he had that down. He's a great I marker, man. Detour. Incredible. Yeah. The oh, Men yeah. in Black. Tra- How good was Men in Black? The song. I know. The mu- it was a music video we era too, so you would Men see the yeah, characters, the and they had the aliens, and they're doing the dance, and then he's doing his Bro. little uh, getting jiggy with it thing. Well, okay. Now that we opened Masterclass. the Will Smith bag of worms, let me add two things. Jack, I love how you went down the rabbit hole. Here's a Will Smith uh, 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 nugget. Uh, welcome to another episode of Night Investment Advice. We've got an NAI boys here today. Jack Butcher, Trunk fan, Bilal Zaidi. Trunk, where the hell are you, mate? You look like you're in the Sahara Desert or something. What, where are you? Arrakis. <laughs> For God's sake. All right, Tr- Trunk's you know got I'm a in, new you location. You know I'm in Arrakis. I got a new location today, boys. Don't worry about it. Okay, if we're not letting people know. Just you yeah. got to keep it. No docs in here. No docs in on the NAI pod. Son. That's spice. There we go. Spice. All right. Tr- Jack, what's going on? I will show you guys what world, I'm drinking, mate? though. I got a new drink. Oh, I've been hitting the Celsius. What do you guys think about Celsius? Celsius is winding into the Sahara Desert, so I can't really see it because it's... <laughs> there uh, you go. Do you guys ever drink Celsius? <laughs> what is it? Like a zero sugar Red Bull It's or like a Red Bull, basically. I found it. I mean, Jack would appreciate this. My last trip on Costco. They had that eight, eight, 18 pack, like two bucks. You know, there I'm going to get that. <laughs> No, I've had it before. No, this is a Red Bull affiliated podcast now, Trunk. So. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's true. Wait, wait. what? Jack, no Jack did work with him, no? I thought you, yeah. he already did it. A friend the, of the, the pod. Formula Red one. Bull is a friend of the pod. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, Bring in Celsius one. on there again. There we, there we go. Exactly. Jack, you've been got, telling us you're in. <laughs> I just got checked. Go Don't yeah, you, you got to let him know. You got to let him know. Celsius back on this pod again. Jack's a loyal guy. Jack's yeah, a loyal man. guy here. Jack, uh, you've been hitting the um, Nashville circuit, sounds like. You said you had a friend in yeah, town. Got a friend in town. Been um, Well, they've been showing me places, man, because we're not getting out that much. But they uh, wanted to go to this place yesterday. It's called 1230 Club. A little Justin Timberlake venture on Broadway in Nashville. Here. Sounds like a trunk thread in the making, this. Yeah. Right? Uh, yeah. Nashville's the little finest. Venmo request for some Oasis tunes from the live music there. Wait, and, what? Uh, What's that? You you have to request with Venmo. Yeah, on you Venmo, you send the tip, and you in the tip in the comment box, oh, you put no the song. Way. Very oh, clever. it's like a, it's genius. like the jukebox. It's like twenty first century version of jukebox. Yeah, that's it's good. funny. It's uh, honestly, there's this guy. It's incredible. They uh, take the request, and then you'll see him like get his AirPods out and like listen to the song for thirty seconds. He obviously, doesn't know every song you're going to request, and in that amount of time figures it out, pulls up the probably the chords on his iPhone and just bangs it out. It's what? unbelievable. Oh, wait. To watch. oh he's play- this is like on an instrument. Yes, live music, yeah. You can request wow. any song and they will like, you know. So I thought you took my he's whipping out on the decks there, son. Like a little yeah. virtual no, Check. Mate, the guitar, he's doing it wow. live. Yeah. That's in yeah. that's in that's like Ed incredible. Sheeran levels. Wait, you know? actually, Jack, incredible. like the the, the level up. of like average talent on like live music performance on Broadway is ridiculous. Incredible. Yeah. For real. It's like Go they on, would Trump. be the top. They would be the top in every other city in the world. Right. The average person. Incredible. Um, Jack, shout out to a friend of the pod, George Mack, who commented about Oasis a couple episodes ago. Oh, Jack, I don't know if you saw that. Oh, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, I didn't see it, but yeah. what do you say? Well, I mean, first of all, uh, for the listeners who may not remember, George, great dude, uh, British cat. So what, Actual I'm sure, friend of the pod, I'm by the way. I'm sure an actual yeah, yeah, yeah. friend, <laughs> not like Michael Saylor and uh, Sundar Pichai, but like an actual friend of the pod. And I know he's listening to this one, but I just want to say, George, after George posted about why Liam and Noel got started, which is a crazy reason, but I was listening to another podcast. I want to bring this up for Jack, which Jack will appreciate, is uh, Wonderwall is only one of two songs from the 1990s that has a billion streams on Spotify. Oh, uh, what's the other one? So, uh, Frick, what is the other one? Uh, I'm going to find it, but... 90s. I don't know. I can't. How crazy is that? The 
the whole point and uh, the podcast I'd listened to was called 60 Songs That uh, Explain the 90s, a great pod from The Ringer. But the whole point the guy was trying to make was like, when Noah Gallagher is coming up, right? It's like in his mind, it's like, I just got to write the greatest song, the greatest album. Man, the guy actually did it. Like 30 years later, one of only two songs to have a billion streams from the 1990s. Like that song still resonates, right? Even though the lyrics make zero sense. Like the lyrics to Wonderwall make no sense. And Noel Gallagher knows that. He doesn't care. But I thought you'd appreciate that, Jack. I, did, I didn't one. think it didn't make sense until George posted that or you posted yeah. it. And I was like, actually, wait, what was, what was the line he used as an example? I was like, wait a minute. That was that a champagne make... supernova, but they oh, both yeah. don't make sense. He actually says, Noel Gallagher says, he didn't care about the lyrics and he cared about the melody. Mm-hmm. So like, right? It's like he, he'd make the good melody and then he'd just let his brother go ham on it. Uh, obviously, that relationship was <laughs> it's a little rocky. But let me see a billion stream song. I'm anyways, looking now. Is it November Rain by Guns N' Roses? Does that sound about oh, right? Oh, that... I wouldn't be shocked if it's a. I'm Gundam not a Rose massive Guns N' Roses, so I don't even know enough. But uh, it might be that Nirvana, could be the other actually. One. Uh, I feel like there must be more than two songs that have got a from billion the 90s. from the 90s. Juicy, you know, is, is, there, is it a billion? Beat. I, no, I'm, I'm it making it up, but it should do if it doesn't already. Mm. Okay, well, that's you probably wanna, a good shout. Probably uh, you wanna, yeah. you wanna hit, one of those. The there must be a hip hop classic in there, surely. But anyway, let's get it going, boys. We got some edge of the internet stuff. Jack is back this week, and we're going to talk about the bass. Layer two, you might have seen it on your feeds. Um, there's been a lot of talk about Solana taking a lot of the ETH mind share in the last, you know, in this cycle. Um, all the, the the crazy meme stocks, that meme coin stuff we've talked about in the pod a bunch. Uh, but base is an interesting example um, with Coinbase. So we're going to talk about that. And in a similar vein, there's a guy on Twitter called Satoshi. Uh, he's an artist, right? Is that mm-hmm. is that mm-hmm. right, Jack? So kind of in your world. Um, and there was an interesting kind of project, something that popped off there this week. And we're going to round it out talking about the ETH ETF chances. So that's kind of the edge of the internet stuff we usually cover. Then Trung's going to be talking about the Gmail 20 year anniversary. Well, that's going to be like you, Bilal, because you are a former Google employee. Friend of the pod. Friend of the yeah. pod, exactly. So we'll <laughs> talk about that. And we're all going to crush on Matrix turn 25, which exactly. makes me feel old as shit. That's, yeah, that's <clears throat> depressing. Jesus Before Christ. Jack Cooks. Uh, it was uh, Smells Like Teen Spirit. That was the other one. Oh, Wonder Wall and Smells Like Teen oh, yeah. Spirit. There okay, you go. Fair. Two right, songs from the 90s with a billion streams. Go ahead. All right, perfect. All right, Jack, what is Bass Layer 2? Uh, I've read a little bit about it and seen, I haven't really messed around with it because I tried to stay off the, you know, I don't really, I'm not trying to get too in the weeds right now. But what, what is going on with Bass Layer 2 and uh, what's your experience of it so far? I think the layman explanation of an L2 would be like it's mimicking the infrastructure of Ethereum, but bundling all of the transactions at a different rate in order to save costs, right? So it's like one layer of abstraction out where, and I don't know the specifics on the amount of time that bundling has happened over, but what they're able to do with that infrastructure is reduce the costs of buying a token, minting a token, moving a token, like the transaction costs have gone from some of the things that would be like deploying a contract on Ethereum L1, depending on the size of it, be 40 bucks, 50 bucks, 100 bucks, 200 bucks, depending on the congestion of the network. On base, it's more like 20 cents. And and so it's more comparable to the cost of Solana than... Uh, L1 Ethereum, but it benefits from the security of Ethereum and the value that's already locked on Ethereum. And base, if you didn't guess by now, is a is a Coinbase initiative. So they also have this incredible distribution, marketing. Like I don't know how many Coinbase users there are in the world, but it's definitely in the millions, right? So so their advantage, I think, has been in that distribution they already own the popularity of this thing has gained traction way faster than other ethereum l2s because of their ability to reach so yeah. many people and i also shout out there's a guy his name's jesse pollock and he's the like i don't even know what his job title would be but he's like the base guy so he's just been like relentlessly pulling people from different ecosystems to build things on base uh does he work at coinbase 
Does yeah. he work at Coinbase? Okay, okay. Yeah, and uh, so Farcaster has been a huge incubator or the culture around all of this stuff. A lot of it has happened on Farcaster, and we talked about that a few weeks or months ago now, where there was an explosion of use there, and all of those sort of things that have been built over the last few months are now finally gaining traction. And some of the behavior from back in 2021, where you'd have uh, just an explosion of activity around uh, different collections, different ideas, there's some like the beginnings of that starting to happen. On parallels, yeah. And it's also kind of taken some of that like meme coin mimesis from Solana because of the cost as well. So there's been a few... Uh, a few of those deployed that have run up like, I don't know, a couple hundred million dollar market caps in a couple weeks. Yeah. Um, and there's a whole other ecosystem that I think we'd need, I need to <clears throat> get a little bit more clued up on before I talk about it, but there's this coin and this platform product slash slash thing called DGen that was, that was incubated on Farcaster, which is like a, primarily like this tipping mechanism so they kind of found product market fit for this thing before the token was launched. So you would be building up a balance of this coin before the contract was deployed. And then this kind of retroactive airdrop happened. And I think that's the most quote unquote successful uh, token on um, base so far. But yeah, just seeing a lot more... Um, creativity happening there because obviously lowering the barrier to entry economically is a huge um does a lot for getting people involved and something about it being one layer of abstraction away from ethereum does feel like more of the nft culture specifically lives there versus like a solana where uh people there's they're almost like two different two different countries almost. The, the cultures are very different on the different chains. So uh, the example that we're going to talk about as well, Satoshi launched a CCO uh, PFP collection in 2021 called MS. Yeah, so Jack, can you uh, explain those yeah, acronyms? Because oh, right, we've right. talked about in the pod CCO, the kind of open yeah. source this stuff. So, and then... so if you guys know the meme, uh, are you winning, son? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like the dad that's like, it's a stick opens figure the door, door. <laughs> opens the door. There's a kid on a computer and it says, are you winning, son? And then there's a, like infinite, infinitely, uh, it's been infinitely interpreted for all these different situations. Know your meme, whatever. So MFers is a remix of that where it like takes the side view of the kid at the computer, adds all these traits, like the typical uh, profile picture collections you see everywhere else and minted 10,000 of them. And it went kind of the same way as all of these others have gone over the last few years. Like people have built out communities around it, blah, blah, blah. And then last week he sort of came out of the blue launching this token that is on base that was, he assigned allocation for people based on their activity against his work over the past few years. So if you bought one of these things, if you bought one of his one of ones, if you like, if you interacted with that ecosystem, you got allocation when the token dropped. And then, you know, that's, that's now out there doing its thing. Um, and that kind of became a little mini meta in itself where people are retroactively like creating these tokens for people that have, verifiably interacted with whatever they had put out previously. Um, so I think we'll see a bunch more versions of that. It's kind of the, all these things feel so compressed now where you see like a good example of something happening or, you know, there's like a lot of attention on something and then it, there's a hundred copycats of it. And then the next thing rolls around, same thing, same thing, same thing. But these faster networks are allowing those trends to play out way quicker than, they previously would have on Ethereum or there's like a hundred dollars to get in and out of something drastically changes the amount of people that are going to get involved. So, uh, yeah, it's, um, growing quick, the base ecosystem. Yeah. What, like you saying about how many 
new kind of projects like retroactively people kind of taking something and just building a coin or building something even if it's not those people like the example from yesterday i think was uh uh ansem's cat did you see this you guys see this on this is i mean if people don't i mean it's a hilarious thing but also ridiculous so ansem is one of the the guys on crypto twitter he's a, he's a funny dude um made a lot of calls that people follow what he's posting essentially and buying a lot of the stuff he shares but then he posted i think a picture of his cat and people were there were literally people out there trying to figure out the name of the cat so they could buy this token it's, it's kind of ridiculous behavior Mental, yeah there we go so jack's sharing something here we I'm go i'm just going to show this? this this is a, a dune dashboard for yeah. base perfect so i think probably the most salient point here is daily transactions mm. so when is this so yesterday there was two million transactions on base cumulatively there's been 122 million in you know less than a year so and you see this like Do you know how, how that compares here. to like solana or something like that is that i have no idea i imagine it's still i imagine it's still a fraction of it but the rate of growth is is massive quite yeah. ridiculous yeah and but i think and the something thing, like yeah, so the friction in in something like base is you have to bridge ethereum over to it to use it and that's like that's not a one way process but it is like it takes time to get your funds back on l1 on mainnet so like people move funds over here and then the bridge back is like 7 days or something so depending on what service you use or, or like what fees you pay so there is friction on getting people there, but when they're there, like they tend to partake in more of the ecosystem. Uh, it's like a yeah exchange, like any other kind of currency exchange. Right? It's like these things that you you would see p play out in the physical world happening digitally. Where Solana was the example three or four months ago, where a lot of people spend a lot of time in and around Ethereum, like oh I'm not doing that because I got a you know convert this, move it over here, set up a new wallet, do X, Y, and Z, and base. Uh, outside of that bridging transaction, all of the infrastructure is the same. MetaMask, blah, blah, blah. Everybody's familiar with, or everybody yeah. that's been spending time on Ethereum is familiar with how it works. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, just um, yeah, loads loads happening there. And Jack, and can I follow up is, with a couple of questions? Yeah, go. Is, so is Farcaster built on base? No. Uh, but the community of people building things in and around uh, base are on Farcaster primarily. Okay, let me let me keep peppering you in follow ups. Uh, so base uh, is it being framed as Ethereum solution for Solana? Is that like the explicit messaging around it? No, I don't think. I mean, I think the L two thing has been part of the Ethereum narrative for a long time. Like. Vitalik and the Ethereum Foundation yeah, we, is like we talked about L1. it from the last thing like just for, to remind people the names like Optimism Polygon Arbitrum Starknet like you would have heard those phrases from last time round and so people were already kind of playing with it last time round a few years ago and now there's there's more and so it's, it's like dealing with yeah. the transaction cost right that was the biggest uh, one yeah of and the speed and transaction cost Ethereum. speed yeah. transaction cost Solana uh, built its entire L1 with that in mind, right? Like it was former, I think, Qualcomm chip engineers. They want speed and transaction, uh, high speeds, low transaction costs. Okay, so base, Jackie mentioned, there is that one layer of friction, but once you're there, you don't have to move. If you're already in the Ethereum community, you're basically just waiting for this instead of jumping over Solana, right? I think a lot of that was the, like, that was a lot of the commentary happening on Twitter was like, people that missed that whole frenzy of activity on Solana that also played into this like last few weeks of madness on base specifically because it's like that's just a behavior that couldn't take place on Ethereum until well it could have but no one hit the network effect or there was there was just hasn't been Is there been... meme coin activity on uh, base? Yeah. Okay, yeah. but it's not it hasn't taken off like a Geo Bowden, yeah, which is obviously Solana based. Yeah, not yet. Well, okay. <laughs> there'll be a well, few examples. Like, there'll be a few examples of ones that have like gone ridiculous. But what's a big name right now? Let's throw some red meat for uh, for Wag Me a couple weeks ago. That was complaining that we weren't. Uh, <laughs> we're not, I don't know some names. I don't know. The 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 one I referenced, the DGen one, is uh is the like native um, Farcaster tipping current like okay. unofficially. That's probably the best example of one that's had gone on to have a big run. And then the one we just talked about, MF for 
is a is a, de- a base DGN MF. Yeah, <laughs> looking at it now, this future of finance, brothers. You can see yeah. here, boys. I think this is correct. Let me just put share my screen because. Uh... So as Bilal is pulling this up, Jack, I have a, I have one more question for you uh, regarding Coinbase specifically. Mm. So Coinbase is back to a sixty. Okay, so Bilal pulled this up. So okay, this so is these just are the real top quick. base. Uh, again, I don't know enough. I know Prime because uh, boy Anson oh, has D-Gen. been chilling yeah. that for a while. DJ, yeah, so these are all apparently on okay, the Okay, well, why don't ecosystem. we list off for the, the viewers? We have uh, the top 10 market caps on base ecosystem right now. So something's it's called Acceler is 1 billion. Uh, Echelon, Echelon Prime, Brett. Wait, do you know what Acceler is, Jack? What is it? Acceler? Ex- no, I have no idea. No, I don't know that. All right. All right, so Prime Jack, is anyway. a gaming. I yeah. think Prime is a gaming thing. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Brett is pure meme coin, I think. DJ oh, is like utility tipping L3, which you know, I need to do my reading on that, but that's the latest narrative around th- theirs. Is there's an L3, it's just uh, <laughs> impossible to keep up with this stuff at this point, boys. It's like, yeah, it's yeah, really yeah. nuts. All right, so, so Jack, you kind of get the idea. I'll, I'll stop sharing now, but yeah, yeah, that was uh, no, that, that was a great overview. So, I had one question 50,000 foot about Coinbase. So I'd love your perception on this, not investment advice. This isn't a stock segment, even though it sounds like one. Coinbase is up six times from its its lows. So it was at, it, 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 I think it IPO'd at almost 100, either 80 to 90 billion. It fell all the way down to 10 billion market cap at the bottom of the crypto, like around FTX implosion time, which is 18 months ago. We should, I should talk about SPF shortly after this, just a quick rundown. Um, it's back up to 60 billion. So, and the the run it's had over the past six months has been insane, right? Along with the crypto rally. How much of this base ecosystem uh, is it uh, part of its long-term value versus a uh, an exchange for various cryptos? Like, well, how would you view that? I know, like, you haven't, like, dug out all the mm-hmm. fundamentals in the Microsoft Excel, but looking at that business, especially in a world where they're not going to be able to take 1.5% on transacting Bitcoin, right? The ETFs, ETC. Like if for listeners don't know, a big part of Coinbase's uh, pre-IPO pitch was that they had crazy transaction fees that they were, that they, I mean, deservedly, I guess, they were security first, compliance first. So they're charging quite a bit on their transactions. All that's going to come down as you get the fidelities of the world, the BlackRock participating. So Jack, how much of something like base where, you know, they've been in the game for 10 years. They've earned the trust of a lot of people. Oh, and also, you know, earned the mistrust. They've, they've had the up and downs. So very specific question. How do you see base playing into their value in the long term? Is it a big part or just an experimental thing? I think so. I, th- I mean, I think their long-term ambition and, their re- and the things that have happened recently are like Coinbase as a custodian between a custodian or a like platform between institution and crypto in general. And I think base, my understanding of the ambition there is for that to be that infrastructure that, you know, brand X tokenizing something in the same way that they are running or custod like uh, custodying funds for 85% of the ETFs, 90% of the ETFs. To me, this, I think the ambition is to make that the transaction layer for a lot of this stuff that's going to be happening in the coming years. They make fees on every base transaction, like minuscule fees. But um, my understanding is that handling all of the headaches that would otherwise be like a ground up build for somebody outside of this ecosystem is the value proposition. But I don't, I I don't, it's not to say that I've had that explicitly written down anywhere, but my understanding of it is that, and like Coinbase wallet as an application, like abstracting away all of the insanity that you have to understand to interact with all of these different uh, chains and products and protocols. Another thing I would probably describe their ambition as is to get to like being the front end for crypto multi-chain and base 
likely act as the um the settlement layer for all of those things right like that's the the uh the product on coinbase's side that allows for all this interactivity to happen and uh they're also building the wallet app which i think has been like under discussed generally where what it would take for somebody that's outside of this world to interact with these things happening on base today is a ridiculous amount of lifting right it's like you have to have somebody that's been in the trenches for three years to even understand how to like set up the wallet like save your, the private key move money from this network to that network versus coinbase is the on-ramp and the interactivity layer so like base is the the conceptual bridge between like just using crypto as a store of value or like buying and selling coins so like being the interactivity layer so all of the uh actions that happen beyond just buying and selling coins on a on a list coinbase wallet and base i think the ambition is to get to to be that one click or simplified way to interact with all of these products and protocols that's actually quite bullish to be honest because bullish in this sense again not investment advice but if you actually looked at them a year ago because we saw these etfs coming online and everybody else entering the space it's like if, if fidelity or blackrock they're not making a base right i think that I, I didn't realize I had not been following this at all, even though uh, I actually have a coin-based position when I was just throwing shit oh, at man, everything I, two I, years yeah, ago. I, guess. Same, I yeah. didn't even I didn't even realize, uh, I, dude, until literally 30 minutes ago, I had no idea about base. And, but it, it makes me uh, more likely to hold on to my coin-based, actually. Was, I because mean, it makes sense. They're, they're just an unbelievable... They're doing an unbelievable service for the crypto industry at large too, with what they're like doing in court and like trying to push for the legitimization and clarity around this stuff. Uh, it's, they have an unbelievably good reputation in the like native crypto world too. Um, yeah. So it's, it, it feels like, the ETF thing too is just like such a massive watershed moment in even securing the long-term value of something like Coinbase. You would imagine you're responsible for, or you've been audited to the extent that you can custody hundreds of billions of dollars of Bitcoin for, for these the trillion dollar know, firms. They are, uh, yeah, they are the custody of choice for, for basically every single ETF, ETF, Bitcoin much. ETFs. The Fidelity does its own. Because uh, Fidelity is a monster, right? Fidelity is like I think hundred billion dollar private others, right? company. Yeah, um, dude, that's awesome. That is a that is a solid segment. I was unaware of that, man. As uh, well, should we? Would that be actually a good transition to SBF? Uh, we don't have to go yeah, deep and on it. Also, but the, the ETF we were going to talk about really quickly as well because that's kind of related. So let, let's come back to to SBF. But uh, we talked about it briefly, like maybe a month ago. So where do you guys? feel we are with this kind of Ethereum ETF situation because I know, you know, a few months ago we had the Bitcoin ETF approval that has obviously been very positive for the whole ecosystem. We've seen, I think, like $11 billion of inflows, maybe more. I, I'm, I'm forgetting the numbers off the top of my lot, head. Yeah. Um, significant. And obviously anyone who's buying an ET, buying the ETF in their BlackRock account or whatever, that then means they have to go and buy the actual Bitcoin and hold it. So that has been a really massive buying pressure for the whole market. And the hope was that would be the same for Ethereum ETF. I'm just going to pull up the poly market chances here. Um, we've shared this before as well. So this is poly market where people kind of bet on if something's going to happen or not. So the uh, the the thing here, it says Ethereum ETF approved wow. by March 31st. Wow. That's gone okay. down significantly. To So for people who are only listening, the chances now out of a dollar at 19 cents for yes 82 cents for no so you know highly the market here is saying it's very unlikely by may 31st which is coming and up that's, in, that was uh true of the the bitcoin one too right they basically dragged it out until they were like legally unable to, to deny it anymore yeah um 
so so it's consistent with the process that's been happening but i think the speculation that it might be different is because this is post bitcoin approval right? yeah well yeah, there's exactly. also what's the michael Siller answer why is, what's the difficulty of a bitcoin etf it's the securities part of it right mm -hmm. bitcoin as michael Siller said is a commodity there's not a single person that can influence uh, well, funny that he says that, right? Because he owns one percent of the the big. It's so funny because Sailor's entire pitch is like, it, it is a commodity. It's not not a single person has their hands on the lever, but this guy owns one percent of the supply, and yeah. he's the greatest evangelist in the. This is the greatest evangelist since Martin Luther was putting the ninety five theses on like the Protestants uh, in Germany, right? In uh, in, in fifteen seventeen. Anyways, quick thing. Uh, I know you guys laughed at that day with random day throw, but uh, the his whole point, right, is like Bitcoin. I mean, uh, Ethereum is security, which creates a lot of complications uh, for the Bitcoin application. I think a big part of it is the staking too. I think the staking and uh, how the staking works is a is a bit of a hiccup uh, for people that, that uh, and, uh, maybe need a refresher. Uh, Ethereum is a proof of stake, whereas a Bitcoin is proof of work. And uh, the the staking part of uh, how Ethereum its network works uh, it sounds like it's an impediment to the ETF filings. That is my understanding of very minimal internet research. Jack, do you have more in depth thoughts? You know what the um, best take I've seen on this is, uh, you know, Brian Quintenzis. Not familiar. He is the, I think he's like general counsel, crypto, uh, global head of policy, Andreessen Horowitz Crypto. So let me read okay. you a little. Uh, yeah, I think I've seen thread. some of this stuff. Yeah, go on. When the SEC allowed Ethereum future ETFs to trade on its regulated security exchanges, it explicitly acknowledged the status of the underlying ETH as being a non security and outside of its jurisdiction. Importantly, this ETF approval decision in October 2023 occurred well after Ethereum changed to proof of stake in September of 2022, meaning that to the SEC, if ETH in its present state as of October 2023 was not a security. If the SEC had any doubt about the regulatory treatment of ETH in October 23, it wouldn't have approved the ETF. If ETH were in fact a security, then the CTFC listed futures contracts on which the ETFs were based would be illegal as any derivative on ETH would be considered a security futures contract and subject to different rules listed on different exchanges and subject to joint SEC FTC jurisdiction. Moreover, if ETH were a security, then the ETH futures ETF would be an illegal instrument. The SEC cannot approve an illegal instrument to trade over a national securities exchange. It will be interesting to watch what, if any, excuse the SEC uses if it were to delay or deny an Ethereum ETF, given it has already informed the market on ETH being outside its jurisdiction. The SEC's conduct in refusing to acknowledge these facts is causing confusion and actively harming the public, aka That's... Trung fans portfolio. <laughs> oh man, that is we'll okay, so... well, very sharp thing... writing. Yeah, yeah very good. I'll, I'll, I'll add one more kind of thing to the mix here is our boy Larry Th Larry Fink and also BlackRock. Big Bags Fink. Their approval rate for ETFs. Uh, they have a 576 to 1 rejection approval what was rejection? rate ratio. Uh, I'm not sure. I'd have to look Let's that up. Let's pull it up. But... It's going to be something. And I also, <laughs> I'm reading this somewhere. I, I haven't fully verified this, but I've I read that previously. Yeah. I got to um, find out. Yeah, we got to find they, out what that one is. Here you go. I got it. I got it. I okay, got what it. What is it? Sole rejection was a 2014 application for an active non-transparent ETF. I don't even yeah. know what that means. It might be. It sounds like maybe active hedge fund. Uh, quick question. Blah. Did they file for an ETH ETF? I think yeah. so, no? Yeah. Yeah, they want, everybody the, has. There's there's like okay. tons of them out there. So now, that's right? a lot of the argument here is, you know, the key thing in the poly market thing I'd, I'd share is ETF approval by May 31st, which I guess was the deadline, the upcoming deadline for an approval or something, right? There, there used to be another market, maybe it was another website for by end of the year and the percentage chance was way higher as voted by the market in this prediction market it was like closer to 60, 70% or something like that. So my personal opinion, obviously it's just my opinion. I don't know what I'm talking about is eventually there will probably be an approval, but it probably very likely won't be in this May 31st, maybe not even by the end of the year. It might get dragged out a little bit. I'm not sure. 
But personally, you know, the, if you you got to look at the incentives to all the people involved. And BlackRock aren't like messing around with this sort of stuff, right? They've seen no. how much is coming in from this one side. They all want to keep playing uh, at the party here. So I think they'll eventually create the case for it and they'll have to fight like like everyone did previously. Um, now, the other question I'd have, though, is in that time that we've talked about today, Solana, you know, the base uh, layer twos, all that sort of stuff. Now, base is on Ethereum, right? So that's still bullish for Ethereum in its own way as an ecosystem. Uh, but we've talked about Solana taking mind share from what was happening in 2021 of the, the equivalent of meme coins and NFT stuff. A lot of that is happening on Solana this time around as well. Now, like, how do you feel about Ethereum as a kind of ecosystem? Because there is a little bit of a shift even outside of this kind of approval. Well, just in terms of like competing for, uh, for applications Mind with something like Solana. Yeah, just applications, mindshare, like the popularity of it as all of these things continue to develop over time. You know, you could also include um, developers like, you know, 2021, a lot of people were like, oh, I'm learning how to make smart contracts on Ethereum. I'm yeah, going to yeah. go yeah, into yeah. this. And Solana now is an alternative for them to do that. I, was, I should preface it with like, I've only played around with Solana and been like in that world for probably six months and just learning uh about the differences but my model for it i think is like ethereum is just like further up the adoption curve where you have like institutional discussions happening and blackrock applying for governments etfs and governments thinking about using like i think like french government deployed a a, a digital currency on ethereum so it's like that to me is like part of the mind share, at least of the part of the culture that we pay attention to shifting to the new thing where it's more exciting and faster. And there are like more novel applications being developed on it as a function of it being fresh out the gate faster. Like you're not competing with like big behemoth established, like Coinbase is building products on Ethereum, you know, versus there are obviously like massive legitimate businesses building on Solana, but it's not a 10 year old product that has the like mind share that has evolved to start to develop products that are designed to be here for a very, very, very long time. Right? I think Ethereum is, is probably past that yeah. threshold, whether or not the More history. SEC or the U S government is like on the same timeline as that. It feels like, the applications that are being built there are, uh, I wouldn't even say more ambitious, but more mature maybe is the- Yeah, that's a good way to put it. it. Yeah, so, mature and, and Solana will follow that. Yeah. And Solana, there'll be a, you know, Larry Fink's gonna be shilling a Solana ETF in a few years, don't worry about yeah, that. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and like, that's a great way to put it. And also for now, 2024, Joe Bolden or Geo Bolden is being built on Solana, <laughs> right? Exactly you know what I mean? right. So exactly. That's it. So, so I think there's well, a there's a space for both Bolden. of them. Yeah. The, so the Bolden one stronger. gets me every time. I it, know, oh, the, bro. Every single time. It's for the so listeners, uh, Bilal sent a hysterical message. He's like, "I can't sell the Bolden until the election." Not investment advice. <laughs> I mean, a hundred percent. Just for like, you know how I partaked in all the stupid stuff last time with um, what was the Constitution DAO? Remember that? Yeah. yeah Just I wanted to. Have yeah, it on the chain, be there, so I exactly. remember later. Like, oh, that was when we were messing around doing ridiculous stuff there. So you got to be in the Bolden game, not no investment advice. But anyway, so uh, research very well put, Jack, as well. And uh, I, I'm also interested. Just your opinion is interesting because you've built a lot of stuff, right? Like, it's not like you're just a speculator here. Like, you are as well, like all of us. But also, you're you were in the last few years one of the top NFT artists in the world on using ethereum as well so i think that's valid opinion to to get your take there um anything else on that trung as well before we move on mate you, you had the sbf thing you wanted to talk about as well yeah and I, do you guys have any questions about any thoughts on the sbf stuff so let's summarize what, what he stuff? got sent is 25 years was it mm. is that what you're saying trung yeah he got 25 sent 25 years yeah yeah i don't know enough about legal precedent to know like is that a lot or not but um 
Yeah, I, I, I don't I, know. I think it was Board it. who who tweeted, uh, "It's a it's one day for every million and a half dollars appropriated." Wow, that's so wild. That's that's that for for perspective. That is quite an interesting. Oh, he's shilling Bolden tokens to uh, <laughs> yeah. inmates there. I, I, no, all jokes aside, someone did. I think um, is it the was it autism? Was it like the the, the news source on Twitter? What, what's the name of the account I'm talking about? Oh, uh, autism. autism, autism capital. capital. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Autism capital was saying that uh, he, apparently he's been shilling Solana to inmates and uh, security guards. I mean, this guy's pitching everywhere he goes, so uh, it wouldn't surprise me if that's the case. What about well, you, you from? What did you, you think? guys have any, uh, I mean... Well, I think the stuff what, came out in the stuff, like there were materials that came out that were, obviously the financial fraud was a legitimate accusation, right? It wasn't just mismanagement. There was like deliberate uh, deception. And then even the like, altruism the effective altruism the way the stuff was pitched like there is like documentation explicitly stating that this is bullshit like this yeah, is not what was, i believe but we are going to say it to mislead this person i'm going to use it right to my advantage yeah, yeah. so completely uh, yeah i mean i don't even know how you begin to like try and translate that into how much time somebody should be incarcerated but by every account it was like a massive amount of fraud. Massive going. fraud, yeah. Trump, he what was about also you? extreme. Yeah, I'd, I'd add like very unapologetic uh, afterwards. Like even uh, up to like his. I don't know if you guys saw the letter his parents wrote. Like uh, they're basically a mouthpiece for him at this point, right? And the letter was basically saying, you know, he got railroaded. Uh, I think that one of the guys that flipped on him, they try to make him look particularly bad. Which fair enough, right? Like the way the U.S. justice system is is uh is designed is in these type of cases like you want people to flip right like not necessarily that they'll lie but they're heavily i mean it's the whole incentive thing like these people will say and frame whatever it is to make spf look as bad as possible and granted i mean like jack said these crimes were very explicit right the question i had is you know the the running joke kind of in the past year was like if he had just kept this scam going like this fraud going like it would have been fine. It would. He could have. He could have. Not it just would have been, been worse legally. though. In the, it just would have been worse in the end though. You know? No, but that's the point, right? The counter is this: is like people are like the expectation for people that say that or joke about that is that SBS behavior would have been like you know he would have. Uh, like, oh, he's gonna ch completely change at, when he's in the green. Like oh yeah, what, with the, exactly line. right. Yeah. It's like once he's in the green and dug himself out of this Alameda mess, he'll cut that secret tunnel between Alameda and FTX and everything be fine, right? That's what, that's the biggest rebuttal. It's like, no, like this guy. Well, it's kind of like the addicts right? thing, right? It's like, give me, just give me one more hit and I'll give be fine. More. It's my last one. Yeah. Because we also knew that their accounting was like, the, 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 the first of all. And they were literally the doing that too. Message, like though. literally like <laughs> yeah. inhaling amphetamines while they're doing this too, right? It, literally, right? So going yeah. even crazier and crazier. So the biggest like, first of all, the biggest loser of all this was QuickBooks when it got absolutely ripped. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Because they were yeah. using QuickBooks or something, right, yeah. folks? No, dude. That's the why. Guy, so the guy that did the... Uh, the guy That's that did incredible, the, uh, isn't it? Well, well, the guy that did the Enron bankruptcy estate. I forgot his name, right? The guy that runs these uh, bankruptcy proceedings. He came in and was frauds. saying... He came in. He's just like, thing. listen. He goes, they were running everything. They were running a $9 billion like company on QuickBooks. He's like... No offense to QuickBooks, <laughs> you can't be doing that. So I think you're right. It's like even though there's been this massive rally, even though that like that crazy YOLO uh, AI bet that FTX did was stolen money into Anthropic, which is the second biggest mm -hmm. large language model after OpenAI. I think that's turned into like from 500 million to three billion, which is just absurd when you think about it. It's like. He would have just kept yoloing. You're right. I, I agree with you, Jack. Is like if they kept this thing going, it would have just been, been the biggest blow up ever. Yeah, it would have been, been like, like they would just absorb like twenty percent of the, the the planet's wealth and then exploded. Oh my Incredible. God. There'd be like wow. statues of him in every city or yeah. something. You know? <laughs> Unbelievable how like how fast. Could you remember like hands up? We had. Uh, we had oh, Brett Harrison. Oh, yeah, uh, we had the president of the, the U.S. Full disclaimer. The capital efficient business. Yeah. Like you've only got this many employees. It's 
And we were like, oh, wow, that's so, we're like, oh, that's amazing. It's like, maybe they should have had a few accountants, you know, or a couple of people, uh, the expense manager, maybe that's a role was needed. This is not investment advice. Go back and watch that episode. Yeah. Yeah. And oh my no, I mean, like, yeah, for people who didn't follow then, I mean, you know, he was the darling of the industry of he was on front oh, cover dude. of magazines. We all laughed at his shoelace meme. Right. You know, we're like, oh, what a likable guy. He doesn't even tie shoelace. You know, it's like, OK, so th- th- I will say, though, there will be another SBF, right? Oh, Not just in crypto, but in, in everything, pr- definitely in crypto, because, you know, there's a wild west out there right now. But, um, I just want to say, though, yeah. for the record, the guy that asked about the shoelaces was me on that podcast. Uh, so Bilal just threw me under the bus. <laughs> I mean, it was a great it was a great meme, man. It's an all star meme, that one, especially now. Um, all right, boys. Great. Edge of the Internet chat. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Let's talk about Gmail. Unless you had anything else on that, boys. Let's move on to Gmail. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, oh, no, no. no uh, SP, oh, yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. Let's do Gmail. Yeah, all right, go on. Uh, Trung, you you shared something about this. Let me pull it up here. Um, so apparently Gmail is 20 years old. That How old does that make you feel? Because I remember, do you remember when it came out? Like everyone was trying to get an account. You had to be on the invite. You had, you had to be on the wait list or whatever. Um, let me just pull up your tweet here on this. Oh, I'll just read it out here. Google launched Gmail 20 years ago on April Fool's Day with this press release. Many thought it was a joke because it offered one gigabyte of free storage, 100 times X more than competitors. It ruined April Fool's for me because Gmail now has 1.2 users, 1.2 billion users, and I have to take any of the ridiculous product launches today semi-seriously. So, I mean, it is a bit of a throwback, right? Because now we're all used to getting basically unlimited, you know, storage space pretty much. Like a gigabyte of storage of emails is already massive. Or nowadays you get like a terabyte and stuff like that. Um, So... Like what? What did you want to talk about here? Just in terms of no, the I just want to talk about Gmail. We should talk yeah, about Gmail. On. It's such an interesting product, right? Yeah, it's like we we often like to talk about uh, uh Blau obviously worked at Google, and this is one of their uh, products that has eight a billion users. But the interesting thing about a couple of interesting things about the Gmail story. So, do you guys actually remember? I mean, Blau, you mentioned is like when you first got that first gig because I used to use Hotmail, right? What was it? What was the first email oh, you guys yeah. used? I use Hotmail. I use, I use Hotmail. There was AOL probably back in the day. There was a few, but I think Hotmail was the one I used, like MSN Messenger. You know, when you were uh, coming back from school trying to learn how do to you talk remember, to the opposite sex. Sto- you know, yes. You know, do you, you remember storage, bro? It is insane. Oh, wow. Back yeah. in the day, it's like and the spam. You'd, you'd have to come home and delete everything, right? Just because you, you had so little storage. But uh, that was one thing. The other thing I want to say about uh, Google, and actually you read this um, you read this uh, press release, right? So it was released 20 years ago on April Fool's. And obviously Google had this goofy identity, which is what kind of made like this remembrance interesting. This is back when Google was like super cutting edge, super fun, like pre-Gemini mistake, super woke, right? And like super corporate. I mean, don't get me wrong. They were still like a $50 billion company at that time back in 2004, I think it was right pre-IPO. But the interesting thing about this press release, there's a couple of things that I'll point out. First of all, if you read it, it's hysterical. It actually reads like a shit post. So like, here's what, I'll, I'll read you one segment of it. Larry Page added, Gmail solves all my communication needs. It's fast and easy and has all the storage I need. And I can use it from anywhere. I love it with an exclamation. So you read it, you're like, this is a shit post. It's like, no, this is like such a, one of their fake jokes. Cause obviously with Google, their thing on April Fool's is they always did, there's all some joke that came out of the company, right? And, uh, but this came out of, this was actually probably one of the most famous posts that came out of that 20% time. I don't know if you guys remember. Blau, yeah, I was about to ask that, uh, mention so that. So Blau, yeah. can you explain what 20% time is and what are the most famous things that came out of it? Yeah, so the there was this thing called twenty percent projects, and so the idea was kind of like a philosophy of you should always be experimenting and taking essentially twenty percent is a day a week, right? So it's one fifth. So um, originally started from my understanding on the engineering side. So you're an engineer working on your main job, and then you would a day a week. The idea is you could experiment, create new projects, uh, new products. Uh, create a beta, launch it. And that, that was throughout the whole company. Even when I was there, 2010, th- like I had 20% projects throughout the whole time I was there pretty much. And it, it was, you know, the, it's really a side project, right? Because it becomes a 120% project. You still got to do your job and then you do extra work most of the time. But I do think 
I had not, I remember seeing lots of things come out of it. Um, now the thing on Gmail is apparently it's disputed if it was 20%. I'm reading it here. Paul okay. Bouchiet, who's apparently the creator, disputed that it was. But who, who cares? Whatever. AdSense uh, came out of that. <laughs> apparently Chrome as well. But who knows? I mean, a lot of this is also marketing too, right? Because there is like a 20% experiment outside of your core job that is just an idea then gets pitched as something that you should work on for a little bit. At some point, it becomes someone's full-time job. So either way, I definitely experienced it. And for me, honestly, it's probably the most interesting things I did in my job um, probably came in 20% time because it was, you need to do your, your main job and then 20%, like I'll tell you a fun one. My friend did one where, do you remember the South Africa World Cup? Yeah, uh, 2010. 2010, I think, right? Yeah. Um, his name's Stanley and he basically pitched this idea of doing this YouTube thing with a guy called Edgar Davids, who's a you know famous all-star I remember Edgar Davids. Yep. And um, l- long story short, he ended up making it happen. And he was just like an account manager in Dublin, Google, right? And he ended up traveling from Europe all the way through Europe to Africa with Edgar Davids and they did this street football thing. And it basically was a 20% project. And that was stuff that would happen even on the business side where I was on. So really exciting. It made it really exciting because you could actually kind of use that time to do exciting work and you could you know, end up working with other teams. I ended up joining other teams based on, um, you know, some of that 20% time I got promoted because of it, stuff like that. So because a lot of the time you're trying to, you know, in any company, you're trying to show oh, I'm really good at my core job, but here's all these other things I've done. And 20% time was a perfect um, avenue for that. Wait, Bilal, can you clarify that? You said you had to do your own job. So what does that mean? It's like, you basically well, yeah. rush to do all your work within four not days. Not rush. So it's it- more, no, I mean, it's not really. I, I mean, maybe sometimes you officially sign off that this is a 20% time. But what I'm saying is, for my job anyway, my responsibilities didn't really change. It's not like they said on, on like, you for my work, it was I need to respond to people still. I need to do X number of meetings. I need to grow my portfolio of Google's business by X percentage every quarter or every year. So that the target didn't say, oh, because you're doing 20%, your target went down 25% or something like that, or 20%, sorry. So it was, I'm just saying, it's more of like the idea of it is an area where you can grow professionally, you know? Whereas maybe an engineer, I think Trung might have frozen, um, maybe an engineer actually got a day a week to work nine to five on it or something like that. So that's that's how I would describe it. Trung, you still there? Yeah, I'm still there. Hold on, I'm just trying to I'm trying to yeah, wrap on. my hands around this. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, go on. Do you? I, I don't know. Do you tell them that you're doing your twenty percent? Like I'm trying to understand. Yeah, yeah. How does it? Okay, so what exactly is the order of operation for your manager? What do you say? Yeah, what I would say is that officially they're even in the internal system where you apply for jobs there's literally a filter for 20 percent projects so those are kind of official things you can say oh there's a there's one on developing this new product or um working on analytics or something like that like something that's outside your core job you can officially apply for it but a lot of them just come from you experimenting and say like i identified in my teams there was a need for something that no one was working on so i just started working on it and once I said, once I figured something out, I would then take it to my manager and say, I'm working on this. Can I use this as a 20% project? And then they would kind of verbally say yes or no. Now, if you needed to, if let's say I was an engineer, maybe I would have said, well, I need to officially do this so that one day a week, I actually am working on this only on Fridays. And now you're going to take my workload off. That potentially happened with other people. But I'm saying in my experience, that didn't really happen because my sort of job was like you need to get it done in the quarter anyway so if i work nine to five or nine to nine or nine to eleven like it doesn't matter it was more about the the end result versus the time i was spending so that i don't know if that answers your question no, no, it that, just that, depends that's on a, that's, an, that's yeah. a very interesting mechanism yeah. actually is like the the part that i never knew about which you explained was there, it sounded like you said there actually was an official list of 20% projects. That was later. I, I mean, maybe originally, I don't know if they had that, but when I was there, eventually they had it in the internal platform where you search for jobs and stuff like That's that. That's sick. So yeah. it helps with recognitions, which uh, which helps. Dude, it, it's like a positive for the company, right? I know they stopped. And for like time. career growth, because you're, yeah. like, you're, you're bored in your job and you're like, I need to... I need to work in this area, but I can't get a full-time job there. Let me show them what I can do. Like a lot of people did it going from sales to marketing, for example, or like going from Google ads uh, to like a more exciting project, like, you know, the 
experimental stuff that was going on google glasses like all that stuff back in the day so that you could get exposure to that sort of do stuff. do you know why they stopped putting percent time I, d- I didn't know they did but uh I feel like the official, if they did stop it officially, I still feel like the ethos, ethos of it is still probably there. Like it's it's more about the idea of like experiment, go and experiment, do stuff. Obviously, as a much bigger company, that's probably why they probably just. Is it still it there though? I think uh, we're I mean, finding I don't out know. that maybe it isn't. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe it not. Isn't. But I don't, I don't know. It, I mean, yeah, maybe. Who knows? The DEI department ain't liking a lot of these 20% maybe projects. Maybe there were too many 20% projects yeah. in the DEI department, <laughs> yeah. you know, so maybe that's what it was. Uh, but no, yeah, so, awesome. yeah, go ahead. No, I, had, I, had, I was wondering if Jack had any thoughts about Gmail at 20, uh, uh, anything of that nature. I said you covered it beautifully, boys. All right, All right perfect. Right. Great well, stuff. Let's, uh, let's finish off with uh, Matrix. Uh, another birthday. The Matrix at 25. What a, what you a want to film. feel old. What a freaking lizic. Do you guys doesn't, watch doesn't Matrix to me feels older than Gmail being 20 years? Gmail feels younger. Like obviously it's five yeah. year difference, but it feels like 10, 15 years old. Whereas Matrix yeah. feels like, I mean, that feels ancient to me. It's like DVD did you, era. Did you guys uh, watch it in theaters? I don't think so. I think I was What's probably 11? too young. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, I was you're probably right. Too young. That was a rated R. Yeah. I actually did watch it in theaters. I, uh, I had a pliant theater. But I do remember watching it and stepping on and being like, ooh, this movie's different. You have to think about action movies before The Matrix, right? Before that bullet time. Like Arnold, Bruce Willis style, right? Matrix just like, it was just the rawest, craziest sci-fi stuff going on. And think about, I think why we still maybe feel super old, or if you think about it, is how many themes of that movie is still relevant today? And how many, I mean, we love talking about memes here. The meme of the Matrix has, it has stuck, right? Like we, as we've got more digital. Like even like in living. language, like use it. Well, we, we Bill, talked about Blue Andrew, Bill. yeah, uh, Andrew Tate Andrew blew Tate, up yeah. on the internet, was talking about escaping the Matrix, obviously and people before that as well, but. It's a, yeah, it was a, it was an incredible, beyond just the action stuff, which was obviously game changing, just that it was, had so many layers to it as well. You know, like it was such an incredible film, man. One of a kind. The, uh, so I will say like, I'll walk through a couple, we've talked about it, Red Pill, Blue Pill, still very prominent, The Matrix, which uh, Cobra Tate still talks about. <laughs> Jack Butcher's uh, person of the year, but for not the reason he's not. <laughs> <That kid. laughs> okay. A moral judgment, but uh, I mean, just like you know, with Neuralink, that we we actually forgot to mention Neuralink last week, but like the idea that you just learn something with a chip in your brain is like it's like it's happening, like that's all happening. Um, the uh, well, the actually the the under the underrated thing people might forget is like uh, the directors of uh, the Matrix, whether whether the Wachowski brothers in the nineties, they both transitioned from men to women. Are they sisters? So, yeah, the, the the Wachowski, well, the people call them the Wachowski siblings now. And uh, what people don't realize is that movie had a lot of trans themes way before the mainstream. So everything they did was just ahead of their time. So do you guys know why, do you know what a red pill is? The most popular estrogen drug in the 1990s is called Primarin. It came in a red pill. Wow. And yeah, crazy hormone therapy. Um yeah. Dead naming, you know, when uh, uh, it's a big controversy when somebody changes their name in a transition, if you call them by their old name, that's called dead naming. Uh, that's what Agent Smith does in The Matrix. He doesn't call Neo Neo, he calls him Mr. Anderson. Um, mm, yeah. And so a lot of these themes were crazy. They cooked them in the film. But uh, so, quick detour how great of a villain is Agent Smith? Oh my goodness, dude. Oh, incredible. That is a Very good. unbelievable villain. Uh, but I'll, I'll finish with a business story on The Matrix because it is a great business tale. Um, the the Wachowski siblings, which is what people refer to them now, uh, at the time, they'd only done one film before. It was called Bound. The budget for that film was $6 million. They had written about this film called The Matrix. They go to Warner Brothers. They're like, we need, we need $180 million to do this movie. <laughs> Their previous movie was $6 million. Warner Brothers like, kick rocks. We're not giving you $180 million. Uh, they're like, okay, what will you do? We'll, we'll give you sixty million. Sixty-three million was their final budget. So they actually filmed this movie in Australia, and they wanted, 
You guys want to hear some of the people that were floated as Neo's character? Will Smith, Tom wow. Cruise, and Brad Pitt. Uh, they wow. obviously settled on the correct person, which was Keanu Reeves, the legend. And a famous part of this story was they're filming in Australia. Warner Brothers had no idea what was going on with the money. And they're just like, guys, you you haven't sent us anything in six months. It's because that they were spending all that time training in martial arts and gunfighting because there's obviously a lot of that in the film. But they actually filmed it, the intro. If you guys don't remember the intro, we'll watch it out. It's unbelievable. It's one of the best sci-fi intros ever. Uh, and um, they had filmed the intro and just sent them the intro and Warner Brothers shut the app up afterwards. Like, okay, we like what we're seeing here. The movie went on to make 460 mil, the green lit the second one. The last thing I'll add is this is where the legend of Keanu comes in. First one was a hit. They knew they're going to do sequels. Keanu, you know, the, his good guy reputation. He's like, man, I don't need all this cheddar. It's like whatever the back end points are for the sequel, uh, the two sequels, Revolutions and uh, Reloaded. I want you guys to give that to the costume and set designers. So he ended up giving tens of millions of dollars to costumes and set designers for the Matrix. So there we go. Good guy. Good what, guy what a G. What a G. What a G. Also, G. Trunk, did you mention um, all the people that didn't take the role for Neo? Did we talk about that? Yeah, uh, Tom Cruise, Will Smith, and Brad Pitt. That's Will Smith wild. is the most interesting one. Will Smith yeah. went to do Wild Wild West, which you guys may remember. And, uh, oh, yeah. June. Watch it. Yeah, Bagger. That's no, what literally yeah. in my head. Bagger. That was <laughs> Wild, Wild, Wild West. West. Right? You know what's yeah. crazy? Yeah. That format for Men in Black too, where like yeah. the the hit the, the song. Hit song. That's, we, a, that's a good point because really. I forgot that was a very two thousands like thing where you with Will Smith specifically. Miami. Oh no, no, Miami weren't a film. Sorry, my bad. You should have been. <laughs> but it should have been. Yeah, it could have been Scarface. You know what I mean? Like bad remake boys. of Scarface. Oh, bad boy, but yeah. Bad boys, bad yo. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're right, Will Smith. What? That, that, he had that down. He's a great I marker, man. Detour. Incredible. Yeah. The oh, Men yeah. in Black. How good was Men in Black? The song. I know, the mu- it was a music video we era too, so you would Men see the yeah, characters, the and they had the aliens, and they're doing the dance, and then he's doing his Bro. little uh, getting jiggy with it thing. Well, okay, now that we open up the Will Smith bag of worms, let me add two things. Jack, I love how you went down the rabbit hole. Here's a Will Smith uh, 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 nugget. When Will Smith turned down men in black. So obviously he's African American and Lawrence Fishburne, who is Morpheus, is black. So it wasn't gonna be Morpheus. Mor- Morpheus was gonna be uh fuck who was I think it's like Robert Redford or something, something crazy. So they had to switch who Morpheus would have been, right? It would have been Keanu. Oh, and that would have been wild. That would have been wild, right? Last Morpheus thing, is incredible as well. Do you got Jack brought up these points about what was it? What we said bad boys? Uh uh Wild Wild, 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 West. Wild, West. Wild West. Men in Black. Independence Day. Men in... Do you know? What was the Independence the... Day song? That had a big one too, didn't it? No, it didn't have a. It did, he didn't do the same thing. But do you know the story behind Will Smith and going on this crazy streak of summer movies? Do you guys know the story? No. So Will Smith made this banger after uh, banger, right? Bang after banger, right? But Independence Day and Men in Black, which took him to the top of Hollywood. You know what this guy did? Him and his agent. In the early 1990s, so after Bad Boys, say call it 93, 94, they literally looked at the top 10 grossing movies of all time. E.T., Jurassic Park, uh, Jaws, uh, Star Wars. All these films have something in common. Aliens, monsters. So he's like, I want to do alien and monster movies. That's why he did Independence Day. That's why he did Men in Black. So like he literally looked. It was like, it was like the biggest G Made move some ever. incredible, smart a movie in the summer it involves space and it involves some monsters that's literally what he did and his style works with it like the humor style it's a little cheesy like do you know what i just watched literally this weekend i watched both hitch and pursuit of happiness i watched them both again hitch is is incredible he had a tune for that one too didn't he or no Uh, i'm not sure i can't remember that but Uh, what's the one from that it's uh what's the big tune from that um i don't remember that heavy d and the boys what was the song though? Wait, hit song. Now that we found love, the song is called. Oh, there we go. Okay. It's like the at the closing scenes of that. Well, That's here I'll throw good. I'll throw another couple of. That ones era guys. definitely had like a song to accompany the film that and I don't was, think is as pr- the, prevalent now. And also, it was the music video era too, right? It was like That's true. After Michael Jackson did his stuff, was it Thriller? Then, but the whole two thousand. Remember, you'd be Space Jam. Space Jam yep. as well. Yeah, that's, I believe I can fly, right? And wow. uh, yeah, that, there's that like, <laughs> we're, really, we're really, really staying away from that one. 
Yeah. Anytime yeah. I believe I can fly to him, I'm like, yo, Siri, stop. Siri. No, no, that's still a banger. Not going to lie. It's absolute banger. But there's too yo, many man. songs that are getting cancelled. Now, now we can't listen now to now more I money, more problems. Yeah. What's going yeah. on, yeah. boys? This is I can't listen to time. I'll Be Missing You Anymore. That song's mm. done. Oh, my what God. What else, man? Oh, oh my man. god! Oh my god! Great that is we 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 are not do it on the pod fully, but boy, there's a there's a lot of good songs that we uh, uh, another I'll one. Tell you, there. I'm just uh, gonna say it. I'm a flirt. I stopped listening to R. Kelly's "I'm a Flirt," man, and, <laughs> I'm, a flirt. and I'm just saying it, dude. It's you know like what? that was one of my favorite songs at university. Now I'm like, oh, I'm yeah. sorry, we're done. I'm a flirt. We You'd be done. singing that oh, in the club. Dude. I know Trunk just be. And Ti, that song. Oh my god, it's done. I got, it's, I got one more for you, boys. Jack. All right, act a fool. Oh yeah, what? ludicrous. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. act a fool. Yeah, 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 that's a big one too. And then Tyrese had a few in there oh, too, yeah. no? Because yeah. he was also in there. Man, what a throwback that is. But also, no, sorry, we're talking about ludicrous. Did he also do? You know that song, Stand Up. Stand, yeah, up. stand up. But that music video is one of the best music videos of all time. Where he's got the guy, he's got the, he, he says, got ones, a midget man. on my necklace. And yeah. there's a little, a little person on there. Man, <laughs> what an incredible, that era was so good of music <laughs> videos. Because now you don't really there. watch them. Like, it's the YouTube video. Like, even YouTube we, music videos is not really the same anymore. We need to talk about Bilal there. Are you talking about the midget necklace I'm and just there's using, like a little person I'm just, there? Yeah, I'm just using the phrase no, he used, thank you know? You, man. Yeah. 2024. Yeah, it's I've 2024. Grown. No pun You've intended, grown. but you know, it's a... You know, another, you yeah. know, another uh, character we got to do a proper on um, Jamie Foxx. Oh, oh, my God. Just Legend. Dude, Just the, the amount of, of talent he has. The most talented. Maybe the best. Stand-up stand -up comedy. Singer. Music. Best act, one of best actor uh, for uh, Ray Charles, the Ray Charles film, and obviously, dude, he. Stand have you seen? Yeah, do you remember so his good. old stand-ups? This MF so is so good. Funny, my dude. my favorite. Have you seen the video of him where they're hosting a, a roast? The roast, yeah, I've seen. And that, then yeah. he's basically doing it's a voice in someone's him, yeah. head, just killing the other person. If if you're listening to this Jack, right now, we're at the end of the show. Anyway, the go watch the Shaquille O'Neal. Go watch the Shaquille oh. O'Neal roast. Uh, so good, Jamie Fox. <laughs> murders he absolutely some guy that i murders, forgot that dude. guy is like never coming back from that because yeah. it was so Killed good it was him. the momentum like if you want to study like humor and momentum like just momentum in general but like the humor specifically that is the best like we've all been in a party with the boys you 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 know you you drop a couple jokes you get the momentum or like you 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 teasing that's someone what this, pod's all about, dude. this is literally building that is no, that's the perfect it, right? example of that no, this is when people ask me, uh, what do you enjoy podcasting? It's like versus writing. This is the reason. It's exactly what Bilal just said. In writing, you can't have that buildup where you're just fucking losing your like oh when, he, when Jack started mentioning Will Smith 10 minutes ago, <laughs> all yeah. of our brains just now started we're all going playing back ludicrous in songs in our head. As yeah. well. No, but Bilal, let me add something for what you just said. You want to know how talented. Jamie Foxx is. You guys know George Strait? He's one of the best selling country uh, artists of all time. I think 100 million records from Texas, right? Legend. Uh, another recommendation for listeners go listen to this song, I Hate Everything by George Strait. One of the greatest songs ever. Jamie Foxx is so talented. This is an African American hip hop artist. They had him go sing at George Strait's uh, like commemoration event because they knew that he came from Texas, Jamie Foxx, and he's a big country uh, a fan. He's so good that he was singing country songs. Jamie, Jamie Foxx, we should do a Jamie uh, Foxx uh, crush episode. Um, and we also need to do an Oasis crush episode with George Mack. George, you have our DMs. Yeah, Let us know back. when we can do an Oasis episode. That's it. I will, I will say it. real quick, Jamie Foxx, did you guys remember in the Kanye documentary or seeing the clip of when he does, uh, was it Slow Jams with him, right? And he oh. sings the chorus, uh, like one of the best songs ever. But where where Kanye is like, no, no, keep it chill, keep it chill. And he's doing his R&B voice. Yeah. And man, just watching that, because he's talent. He's got, he's got a really good voice. Gay. But yeah. Kanye is like, no, no, no. You got to trust me on this one. And then he's in there like, oh God, this guy don't get my R&B yeah, sound. Yeah. But he, he knew what he was doing there. I will also say, I did play a little basketball one time with uh, Jamie Foxx. Oh, well, mate. Chelsea Piers. At the Knox. Oh, at Chelsea uh, Piers. Chelsea Piers in, in Manhattan when I used to go there. And then also another time in the sauna, guy was ripped. You know, okay, just I got a question. What's, what's the height game? Because you know with all these oh, uh, actors. I don't think he was that tall, The height tall, game actually. is not too impressive. Yeah, yeah, I don't think he was super tall. He's probably, like, I mean. 
Like maybe Tom five Cruise ten, maybe five nine, like maybe five yeah, yeah. seven. But just, I would just say like he's super famous. The fact he was coming to like a, you know, it's a nice gym, but it was like to the open public, right? Like you, yeah. he's talking to people like just absolutely. Also, shout out guy. that uh, there was a TMZ uh, or some one of those uh, gossip mags mistakenly said that he had died or was near death uh, uh, a couple months ago. Don't play with us like that. Yeah, Jamie yeah. Foxx did go through something, a uh, health scare. Oh yeah, that post, was wild. I yeah, forgot about that. He posted uh, that he had uh, survived. Well, thank God. Jim Fox, uh, super talented, still around. So there we go. Let TMZ scare you. All right, perfect way to wrap it up, boys. That was fun. Uh, let Hysterical. us know your favorite ludicrous songs in yeah. the comments below, and we will see you guys next week. And uh, cheers, bye bye.